the John Waters tour of L.A. Los Angeles is everything a great American city should be. Rich, hilarious, of questionable taste, and throbbing with fake glamour. It's even cheap to fly there. Make sure you get a window seat so you can thrill to the horizon-to-horizon -horizon sprawl of this giant suburb and imagine how exciting it would be to see an earthquake while still airborne, incense around yet. There are millions of places to stay, either cheap or ridiculously opulent, but I recommend the Skyways Hotel, 9250 Airport Boulevard, located directly under the landing pattern of every jumbo jet that deafeningly descends into LAX. The guests complain, but we're used to it, confided the desk clerk on a recent visit. Once you've checked into Skyways, change into something a little flashier than usual. Then step outside your room and glance up at a plane that looks like it could decapitate you. If you're like me and think airplanes are sexy, you might want to plan a romantic picnic on nearby Pershing Drive. It's the closest you can humanly get to the end of the runway, where the giant 747s will scare the living bejesus out of you as they take off inches over your head. There's even an airport lover's lane, the 400 block of East Sandpiper Street, where dates with split eardrums cuddle in cars as the sound barrier breaks right before their eyes. It's time now to rent a car, roll down the windows, and prepare for your first big thrill, the freeways. They're so much fun, they should charge admission. Never fret about zigzagging back and forth through six lanes of traffic at high speeds. It erases jet lag in a split second. Turn on the radio to AM. Being mainstream is what L.A. is all about. If you hate the hit parade of hell as much as I do, tune in to KRLA, an oldie station that plays real music, and listen for Wild Thing by the Trogs, which epitomizes everything you're about to see in Southern California. You're now heading towards Hollywood like any normal tourist. Breathe in that smog and feel lucky that only in L.A. will you glimpse a green sun or a brown moon. Forget the propaganda you've heard about clean air. Demand oxygen you can see in all its glorious discoloration. Think of the lucky school children who get let out of class for smog alerts instead of blizzards. Picture them revving up their parents' car engines in their driveways before a big test the next day. Turn off the Santa Monica freeway at La Cienega and drive north. Never look at pedestrians. They're the sad faces of L.A., the ones who had their licenses revoked for driving while impaired. When you cross Beverly Boulevard, glance to the left, and you'll see your first example of the city's fine architecture, the tail of the pup, a hot dog stand shaped exactly like what it sells. Turn left on Sunset Boulevard and take in all the flashy billboards created to stroke producers' egos. Be glad that Lady Bird Johnson lost her campaign to rid the nation's highways of these glittery monuments. Wouldn't you rather look at a giant cutout of Buddy Hackett than some dumb tree? Proceed immediately to Truesdale Estates, the most nouveau of the nouveau riche neighborhoods. If anyone publishes a parody of Architectural Digest, this enclave should make the cover. It's true state-of-the-art bad taste Southern California style. Every house looks like Trader Vic's. Now climb Hillcrest Drive to the top and shriek in amazement at Villa Rosa, Danny Thomas's garish estate, which boasts more security video cameras than the White House. Stop and gawk and wonder why he's so paranoid. Who on earth would want to assassinate Danny Thomas? It wouldn't even make the front page. Now detour to 590 Arkell Drive for the most outrageous sight of all. A house so over-decorated that it actually has curtains on the outside. Can wall-to-wall -wall carpeting on the lawn be far behind? When you get to Hollywood, you'll know it. It looks exactly the way you've always imagined, even if you've never seen a photograph. I always head straight for Hollywood Boulevard. Old fogies like Mickey Rooney are always dumping on this little boulevard of broken dreams, calling it a cesspool and demanding a cleanup, but they miss the point. Hollywood is supposed to be trashy, for Lord's sake. Pick up This is Hollywood, a guidebook that lists all the obvious tourist sites, like Diane Linkletter's Suicide Leap, 8787 Shoreham Drive, 6th Floor, and Kim Novak and Sammy Davis Jr.'s Love Nest, 780 Tortuoso Way. Further along the boulevard, you might encounter the legless, one-armed white guy who breakdances on the street for horrified families as they stroll up the Walk of Fame. 
Look around you and see all the real-life angels, as in the film with the catch line, high school honor student by day, Hollywood hooker by night, and all the David Lee Roth impersonators. Marvel at the fact that Hollywood is the only town where everybody at least thinks they're cute. Fredericks of Hollywood, 6608 Hollywood Boulevard, that famous department store for closet hookers, is a must-visit, not so much for the polyester imitations of their once great line, but for a glimpse of their obscure celebrity room. There it was, at the top of the stairs, with a tacky star on the door and a twisted mannequin out front. What celebrities go in there, I asked a sales lady, so hard in appearance I'd swear she ate nails for breakfast. Oh, you know, Liz Taylor, she says with a straight face. Oh, sure, I thought, realizing I was dealing with a Pinocchio and stilettos. Can I see the inside, I pleaded. After much telephoning to various supervisors, I got a grouchy voice on the line that told me, It's just a room! Finally, a manager, who could only be described as a dame, agreed to usher me in. What celebrities come in here, I asked again. None since I've worked here, she said, trying to position her body so I wouldn't see her use a credit card to jimmy open the lock. Finally inside, I felt like a fool. It was nothing more than a nondescript changing room that looked like it hadn't been used in years. Thanking her, I trotted back out to Hollywood Boulevard, feeling slightly more glamorous. Of course, when you think about it, everybody in L.A. is a star. Idling in my car outside Charo's house, 1801 Lexington Road, Beverly Hills, I spotted Charo's plumber, Leroy Bazzaroni, pulling away in the company truck, John K. Keefe Incorporated, plumbing and appliances, 9221 West Olympic Boulevard. Realizing he was more interesting in his own way than Charo, I called the company to get an interview, but I was juggled back and forth between the owner. Is there any money in this? And his son. We're very busy. It dawned on me that Beverly Hills is the only community in the world where a plumber needs a press agent. After days of phone calls, it struck me that Charo's plumber was harder to meet than Charo herself. Lana Turner's hairdresser, Eric Root, 8804 Charleville Boulevard, was much more cooperative. I've been a fan of his ever since reading the Daily Variety account of Miss Turner's, quote, rare public Hollywood appearance at the Artistry and Cinema Banquet of the National Film Society, where she made a dramatic entrance on the arm of a young, blonde hairdresser. I think she's an artiste, he told me, explaining that he and Miss Turner travel together but stay in separate bedrooms, thank you. He does her hair once a week in the salon she had built in her penthouse. She's got beautiful hair, he said. I just changed her hairdo. I made it a little fuller. She likes it very close, precise. I softened it up for Night of a Thousand Stars, and it went over so well we're keeping it that way for a while. Are there hairdresser wars, I asked, wondering if beauticians try to steal celebrity clients from one another? No, he sniffed. When we go out, we don't bump into hairdressers. Much more elusive was Annette Funicello's garbage man. If you hang out all Wednesday night, the night she puts out her garbage, 16102 Sandy Lane, Encino, you might spot him. His boss graciously declined to give out information, falsely assuming I wanted to look through Annette's cans. As I trembled with fear outside her house, looking over my shoulder for the armed security guard control that a posted notice on her lawn threatens you with, I sadly realized that I had missed the pickup and my chance to meet this mysterious trash man. Oh well, maybe next trip. Since visiting celebrity graves is an accepted tourist pastime in Los Angeles, I wanted to pay my last respects to the ultimate movie star, Francis the Talking Mule. Mr. Ed may be all the nostalgic rays these days, but Francis was the true original. Unfortunately, his final resting place is not listed in any guidebook, so the search for Francis has all the earmarks of a snipe hunt. Most people I contacted laughed in my face. Even Universal's press agent came to a dead end. The Los Angeles SPCA Pet Memorial Park, 5068 Old Scandia Lane, hasn't a clue. But we have Hopalong Cassidy's horse. The Pet Haven Cemetery Crematory, 18300 South Figueroa Street, had Jerry Lewis's and Ava Gardner's pets' graves, but explained that a mule would be too large for our crematory. Wiping away a tear, I made a desperate, dreaded call to the California Rendering Company, buyers of butcher, scraps, fat, and bones, 4133 Bandini Boulevard, and was happy to learn that Francis hadn't ended up in this glue factory. Finally, through the grapevine, I located Donald O'Connor, Francis's on-screen co-star. Knowing the executives at Universal, he said, they probably ate him. There was only one Francis, but he had a stand-in and three stunt mules. 
He was kept at the stables at Universal, and I heard he was 47 years old when he died. If you're fine, Francis, let me know. We'll make another picture together. Through the help of the Directors Guild, I found Francis's and Mr. Ed's great director, Arthur Lubin. Knowing that he had vowed to take the secret of how they made Francis talk with him to the grave, I didn't let on that Donald O'Connor had just spilled the beans. Didn't hurt Francis at all, Mr. O'Connor had told me. They had two fish lines they wet under the bridle, one to make him talk, the other to shut him up. There was a piece of lead in his mouth, and he tried to spew it out. That's what made him move his mouth. Mr. Lubin admitted that Mr. Ebb was the smarter of his superstars. Let's face it, a mule is dumb but relieved my anxiety by informing me that after Francis's career was all washed up, we made five films. They thought that was good enough. The Humane Society placed him in a good home. Francis died on a nice ranch somewhere in Jerome, Arizona, a dignified star to the end. San Francisco may be known as the coot capital of the world, but isn't L.A. really more deserving of that much-coveted title? Think of the infamous crimes and colorful villains that have helped give this city its exciting reputation. Take a historical walk down Atrocity Lane and revisit some of the most infamous crime scenes of the century. Start your day of touring madness by proceeding to Patty Hearst's SLA shootout scene, 1466 East 54th Street in the heart of Watts. Gone is the charred rubble of the inferno where most of these media gorillas met their death, but in its place is a spooky, vacant lot that seems the perfect resting ground for the misguided rebels. Feel like going on a field trip? How about a visit to the Spawn Ranch, 12000 Santa Susana Pass Road, Chatsworth, home of the most notorious villains of all time, the Charles Manson family. There's nothing left, not even a scrap, according to the new owner, but it's still worth the visit, if only to meditate. And if you use your imagination and look up in the mountains, you can still picture this demented Swiss family Robinson, hiding out, plotting, about to make the cover of Life magazine. Across the street, the Faith Evangelical Church was ironically under construction, and they were quite well aware of the situation. We've had people who say there's a force of evil up there, a secretary told me over the phone. Even Gary Wisner, the church business administrator, said, The devil is still up there. I have felt his presence three times at the Ethiopia-Somalia border, the Uganda border, and at Spawn. If your vacation time is running out, there are still a few last-minute sites you may want to squeeze in. Try going to Venice Beach, the only place in Los Angeles that reminds me of the East Coast. Go directly to Muscle Beach, oceanfront walk between 18th and 19th Avenues, but pay no attention to the pumping iron showboats who exhibit themselves in a tiny cement arena surrounded by four tiers of tattered bleachers. Concentrate instead on their audience and experience voyeurism of a new kind, intently watching another voyeur as he voyeur as an exhibitionist is a thrill you probably won't get to experience back at home. As I boarded the plane back to Baltimore, I was so filled with the magic of L.A. I wanted to burst. Ignoring the stewardess's glare, I searched for an overhead compartment to store the witch's broom, actually a dead palm, I found at Spawn Ranch. You had to be there, I joked to a fellow passenger who quizzed me about my souvenir. During takeoff, I felt as if I might go insane from happiness over my wonderful vacation. Not wanting anyone to pop my bubble by speaking to me, I immediately began reading lesbian nuns, and that did the trick. No one attempted small talk. I had six blissful, silent hours, remembering the heaven of being a tourist in L.A. I should have hijacked the plane and gone back. Singing for your supper. When you're unemployable, as I am, you have to think of ways to supplement your income. Between pictures is sometimes my occupation. I barely made it through high school, can't type without looking at the keys, have such a low mechanical aptitude that plugging something in is difficult, would get in fist fights if I worked retail, and I'm a complete wimp at physical labor. Welfare is tempting, but you need kids these days. All I can really do is blab. So I immediately wanted to take my act out on the road, join the new vaudeville, the lecture circuit, put on my tap shoes, sing for my supper, move over, Sammy Davis Jr., I've got to make a living. Vegas, here I come. I always wanted to play vaudeville ever since I was a teenager and used to hook school regularly to attend the Gator Burlesque in downtown Baltimore. My real idol was Blaze Starr, but she performed at the Two O'Clock Club, which she owned down the street, and they didn't let underage kids in. Years later, I tried to get Blaze, who still lives in Baltimore, to play a part in one of my films. 
Nearly reclusive and hard to contact, I finally located her sister, who acts as her agent. Is there any nudity involved? She immediately wanted to know. No, I responded assuredly, considering the fact that Blaze must be in her 60s by now. Oh, well, she wouldn't be interested then, the sister explained before hanging up quickly. I should have known. Legendary strippers never really retire. They still have to show it, even if no one wants to look. I wish everyone in the world was a stripper. Except me, of course. The Gaty was a real vaudeville house, beautiful to look at, and they let anybody in, no matter how young you were. The show was complete. Big-name strippers such as Kim DeMilo, Libby Jones, and Irma the Body. Baggy pants comedians, an orchestra and burlesque routines that were high art compared to today's floor work. They weren't allowed to take it all off, but ignored this law by removing their G-strings and tying them around their waist so they could quickly put them back on in case of a raid, which did happen regularly and only added to my midweek excitement. My favorite exotic dancer in town was Zorro, a very butch local girl who looked exactly like Victor Mature. She'd stomp around the stage naked after removing her cape and mask, sneer at the audience in pure contempt and snarl, What are you looking at? The men loved her for reasons I've never been able to fathom. Given some encouragement, I'm sure Zora would have loved to carve a Z or two on every one of their faces to take home to their wives. Zora must be in her late forties by now, and I bet every time she's lucky enough to hear the TV show theme song, Out of the night when the full moon is bright comes a horseman known as Zorro. She leaps from her velvet recliner somewhere in suburban Baltimore and wildly slices imaginary Z's in the air while ripping off her clothes in a frenzy of nostalgia. In between acts at some of the strip houses, they routinely showed nudist camp pictures, and I was profoundly influenced. Since every other type of bad film is now the rage, I wish they'd revive this much-ignored great genre. The Isle of Levant, The Garden of Eden, Naked Island, Nature Camp Diary, Mr. Peekaboo's Playmate, all classics of a sort. Happy, healthy idiots on pogo sticks with airbrushed crotches was my idea of sexy. I've noticed a few shops in New York that seriously collect the magazines of this period. But not once have I seen a retrospect of nudist camp films anywhere in the world. Come on, Museum of Modern Art Film Department, stop snoozing on the job. It's your duty to preserve these embarrassing classics before the nitrate completely turns to ash. In the 80s, there's not much left of the burlesque circuit, but I still go occasionally. Scattered around the country, a few of the great houses are still alive, but barely. They stay open mainly as an excuse to show porn movies, and the strippers don't even bother to strip anymore. They come out nude, carrying a gym mat and a bottle of hand lotion and get quite disgusting immediately. Sometimes it's so bad it's funny. A few years ago, I went to one of these last remaining striptease shows in Baltimore, across the street from the long, defunct gaiety. It was about a hundred degrees inside. There were three other paying customers. The first stripper came out, and she had tattoos, dirty bare feet, and a mild paunch. As she did her act, she completely ignored the audience and instead carried on a loud conversation with her girlfriend who was waiting for her in the back of the theater. Hey, Crystal, she yelled in a thick Baltimore accent into the darkness. We going over to Sylvia's? Get some beer. Yeah, holly, Crystal, I got it. Hurry up. We're supposed to be there. All right, already. I'm not off yet. I can't leave till 10, she growled back, all the while gyrating obscenely for the pitifully sparse audience. Finally, though, she made a quick exit and was replaced by another talent i soon realized was dead drunk she could barely walk would stand there confused mumbling incoherently struggling to unbutton her outfit finally nude she staggered precariously close to the edge of the stage and apparently got the whirlies the two old men up front hastily retreated to the safety of the third or fourth row suddenly the manager stormed into the theater and started screaming okay tammy you're fired i told you not to go on pack up and leave Tammy stood there confused, finally comprehended, gave him the finger, and promptly fell off the stage, passed out cold. Jesus Christ Almighty, yelled the manager as he rushed to the front of the theater and tried to drag out her dead weight. I joined the other few gentlemen who were running for the exits, but I have to admit in its own special way, it was a show to rival my fondest days of old burlesque. For years, I traveled promoting my films, which in effect means doing the lecture circuit for free. I never understood so-called celebrities who think it's beneath them to promote their work. 
don't they want people to see it? Don't they realize that publicity is a free ad? It is called show business. Aren't they flattered somebody's interested? I even went to Iceland for a visit, the Reykjavik Film Festival, in the dead of winter yet, when there's only a few hours of sunlight a day. You're crazy, showbiz know-it-alls told me. There's only a handful of movie theaters in the whole country. You can't make money there. But anywhere that both dogs and beer are illegal sounds okay to me. My hosts were charming, even the very proper lady from the festival who politely greeted me with, I hear your films are just terrible. I never figured out if she was being brutally frank or if something was lost in the translation, but I thanked her just the same. That night for dinner, the festival people decided to give me a little of my own medicine. We went to a fancy restaurant which specialized in traditional Icelandic food. The main course was a sheep's head, and you were supposed to eat the eyeballs. Remembering my mother's advice to me as a child, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, I tried not to react. They all waited with obvious glee as I followed their eating instructions. First, you gouge out the eye socket and eat it, nibbling your way up to the big payoff, the eyeball itself. What the hell, I thought as I tried to swallow the gristle. Here goes. I popped the eyeball into my mouth, bit down, and felt an explosion similar to a cherry tomato. Beer may be illegal, but Brennevin, Iceland's delicious liqueur, is not, and I skipped dessert and had a few fast ones. I really felt like hot shit in Paris. Jean-Pierre Jackson, a Frenchman who knows bad taste when he sees it, had translated my first book, Shock Value, and it was being released in French as Provocation. He arranged a retrospective of my films at the Cinémathèque Française and was opening Female Trouble in his commercial movie house. I was thrilled to be spreading bad taste in a country known for its good taste. Imagine my disappointment when I showed up at my premiere to see a much bigger line across the street at another theater. What's playing there? I asked Jean-Pierre in a huff. Loosely translated, he said, the title would be They Lick From Behind, Upstaged Again. Of course, nothing could top the very creative bum who waited outside my hotel at the Cannes Film Festival. As I exited, he shouted, Monsieur Waters, stuck a needle through his neck, stretched out an upturned palm, and said, Five francs, s'il vous plaît. I was so appalled that I didn't give him any money, although on hindsight, he deserved a lot more than he asked. Probably the most bizarre invitation I received was to the White House, the Reagan White House. I was scheduled for my road and pony show at the Biograph in D.C., and the week before, I got a call from one of the president's advisors on political affairs. He was a buff on exploitation pictures and invited me to lunch at the White House the day after my retrospective began. Well, can I bring a date, I asked, and he said yes, as long as the person can pass a security check. I brought a man, but he didn't seem to mind. I was amazed that I had passed the security clearance since I had visited one of the Manson family in jail for years. Just how thorough is a security clearance, I wondered. Our host's office was the original one where the Watergate scandal was born. He showed us where the tape recorders were hidden, and best of all, the button next to Nixon's toilet labeled emergency. At first, I was shocked to think that this was the button to start a nuclear war, but soon realized it was for a health emergency, or better yet, to summon a secretary if Nixon had a brilliant idea while on the can. We ate in the White House dining room for guests and talked about movies such as Chesty Morgan's Deadly Weapons, She Kills People with Her Breast, The Undertaker and His Pals, Please Don't Eat My Mother, and other cinematic shockers. The president's man was as well informed on these matters as he must have been on political affairs. We got the complete tour, Oval Office, Rose Garden, but I didn't get to see the Reagan's newly decorated screening room. The president was out of town, but when Nancy was buzzed by a security guard, she said, No, if you go in there, we'll have to do a whole new security sweep after you leave. We were given sets of presidential seal cufflinks and a blue box decorated with Reagan's signature. I was most appreciative, since without a souvenir, nobody I know would have believed the whole day. Back on the street, dazed in the real world, I really felt patriotic for the first time. I wanted to wave the flag and sing the Star-Spangled Banner. Only in America could you get invited to a Republican White House for making films that the very administration would pay to have burned. I was nervous only once. The Baltimore Museum of Art gave me a three-day retrospective of all my work with a black tie opening. Talk about your own backyard. I followed a Grandma Moses exhibit. Somehow I was suddenly respectable. It was as if magically the film had changed content in the cans over the years. 
Here I was, being honored for work I had feared being imprisoned for a decade before. My parents were at the opening night audience watching Female Trouble for the first time. I introduced them from the stage and was amazed to see my father signing an autograph later in the night. The mayor even proclaimed it John Waters Day in Baltimore. Could I have ordered all the beauty shops in town to give free bouffant hairdos for a day, I wondered? The only dissenting voice, in public at least, was from my old nemesis, Mary Avera, one time head of the now defunct Maryland Censor Board. I can't believe a municipal museum would do something like this, she fumed to the Baltimore News American. I don't want my tax money spent this way. I blame him for what's going on out there. Ladies can't walk the streets without some kid grabbing their purses. These kids would steal your garbage cans. The other day I found dead rats in my basement. People see his movies and get the know-how. They get the idea for all these rapes and hold-ups. To tell the truth, I try not even to think of him. I wipe him from under my feet. Just when you think everything is finally working out, something goes wrong. The very weekend of the museum's retrospective, I was forced to deal with a bust. Pink Flamingos, of course, was causing trouble once again after all these years. It seems there was a raid on a video shop in Phoenix, Arizona, and one of the porno tapes inside Sika's asshole or something similar was nailed. At the trial, the defense lawyer for the porno told the judge, You think this is bad? Look at this one, Pink Flamingos, available in the very same shop. Wouldn't you know it, the porno got off and I got hassled. The judge moralized, I can understand why some people in loneliness would rent porno, but why anybody would rent this one is beyond me. Suddenly, Pink Flamingos was heady in the very respectable movie theater in Phoenix where it had played on and off for years. A reporter sent me a copy of the police report by the cop sent to the screening, written in his best dragnet style. The first scene opens showing a large white female, Edie, sitting in child's playpen wearing some type of underwear. He actually sat through the whole film and described it as if he were at a murder site or a car accident. It was one of the funniest reviews I ever read, but we had to sneak the print out of town before it was seized. So much for art. They were not impressed. I get very strange mail. My favorite is a kid named Freddie who wrote, I'm in high school and I make films like you do. How come I get sent to the school psychiatrist and you get sent to Europe? Another kid wrote volunteering to eat live rats on film. And probably the oddest was the guy who confessed, My hobby is collecting sex with celebrities. I don't fucking tell. My other goals beside you are Pee Wee Herman, David Letterman, Grace Jones, Laurie Anderson, all the stars of Rocky Horror, and Klaus Nomi. So what if he's dead? The only letter that really made me nervous was from a girl in Germany who wrote, Your deathly face haunts me, and threatened, One day I will show up on your doorstep. And she did. I didn't let her up, but agreed to meet her at the theater my friend Pat Moran runs, because I know Pat could intimidate a rattlesnake if she had to. The girl turned out to be harmless, but she still sends long, inappropriately intimate letters and presents which I always try to discourage and candy, lots of German chocolate that everybody tells me not to eat in case she's poisoned it. I always vow not to touch it, and it sits there getting stale for months until in a weak moment I take a little nibble. Why I love the National Enquirer The best thing about subscribing to the National Enquirer is that it arrives in the mailbox the same day as the New York Review of Books. How well-rounded I feel. Happily snatching this national institution from the slot, I wonder if the mailman thinks I'm a slob for getting it. To hell with him, I figure, as I scan the headlines, hoping they'll top Barry Manilow. I've got a big nose and I like it. Riding the elevator up to my apartment, I feel so lucky to be a subscriber. After all, the Inquirer boasts the largest circulation of any paper in the country, and it's one of the few chances I have to participate in something so genuinely mainstream. For once, I feel normal. Like millions of others, I too love the National Enquirer. I'm secretly jealous of every celebrity hounded by this great tabloid, since only the really big stars need to be worried. Coverage in the National Enquirer proves you're hot. It's the only true barometer of fame in America. Every day I feel depressed that no paparazzi jump out from behind a bush when I go across the street to get cigarettes. Being featured in the Enquirer has been a lifelong dream of mine. Even a date with Suzanne Somers might be worth it. Does the Enquirer really hurt celebrities? I doubt it. Not the way Confidential did in the 50s, or even Luella Parsons or Hedda Hopper did before that. What the Enquirer does is embarrass. But at least it picks on the living and gives them a chance to fight back. 
Although some agents reportedly make deals to lay off my clients in return for dirt about others, nobody is really safe. Joan Rivers is always shouting, Grow up! Read the Inquirer! But the editors disregard this apple polishing and publish one of the most unflattering horse face photos ever imaginable. I'm convinced that the typical Inquirer readers move their lips while they read, are physically unattractive, badly dressed, lonely, and overweight. Especially overweight. Since the paper treats everyone except its readers badly, it's okay to be a behemoth as long as you're a nobody. Witness the fattest couple contest, in which roly-poly closet celebs compete for a measly $200 prize by sending hideous snapshots of themselves for publication, or the endless pages of advertising for suspicious weight loss schemes. But if you're fat and famous, beware. The Inquirer's most vitriolic copy will be aimed your way. The first headline I clipped from my collection of fat exposés was 167 pounds, that's a lot of Liz. I guess the then chubby Liz had hopped on the scale in some hotel suite and a telephoto lens zoomed in on the exact reading. Or what about wonderful Anita Eckbird, featured in then and now shots, naturally looking beautiful in her early career, but now hugely overweight, wrapped in a blanket with no makeup, clutching a carrot from her garden in what she mistakenly assumed was the privacy of her own backyard. The headline read, Anita Eckberg, what a waste, W-A-I-S-T. My all-time favorite, however, was Whale of a Gal, that's Tubby Tina Onassis. Listen to the copy accompanying this eye-popping photos of Tina at the height of her career as the fatty you love to hate because she's so rich. If there was a Pulitzer for trash, this writer would deserve the award. Quote, Fat cat Christina Onassis is worth a ton of money and she's turning into a whopper herself. Tubby Tina, dubbed Thunder Thighs by the European press, is so fat she has to be helped out of her helicopter. The roly-poly 31-year-old heiress waddles away from her chopper, no doubt, to get herself a square meal. Even though the Enquirer no longer has staff photographers, it remains one of the top paying purchasers of celebrity paparazzi shots. Ugly shots are always welcome. Take the extremely unflattering photo of Robert Redford in the glare of the sun with this screaming headline, It really is Robert Redford. The caption read, Redford's wrinkles are overcoming his dimples in this unretouched photo of the 47-year-old superstar who's finally showing his age, and then some... High fashion seems to be especially hated by both editors and readers. The most outlandish outfits are featured with the prices predominantly displayed in such copy as so stiff and binding the model can't even sit down, or this is going too far. Even Jackie herself might have laughed when they ran the headline, Oh no, Jackie-o, she's wearing the same outfit after four years with the pictures to prove it. The Inquirer's readers love death, and so do I. Who wouldn't buy the biggest selling issue, the one with a photo of Elvis in his coffin on the cover? And how exciting to read about and actually see Michael Washington, a black man with his shirt open to the waist who is now the proud owner of white hunk John Eric Hexham's heart beating inside of him yet. And Baby Fay, God, what a controversy. Baboon heart baby shocker, what a star. Just look at the innocent little darling. Look directly under that photo at the shot of the hideous baby baboon. How interesting to see the nice coverage her parents received in the Inquirer until they sold their exclusive story to people instead. Like a jilted lover, the editors responded, Her mother is wanted for jumping bail. Her father is a drug abuser who beat her mother. Bad taste has never been so naked or cheap. A mere 65 cents for all this? What a deal. Even the lonely have a voice. My all-time favorite self-help piece in this civic-minded publication was Want to enrich your life? Just go to a coffee shop. Here's how to meet interesting people. Its detailed plan for making new friends included 1. Always sit at the counter, never at a table. 2. Make sure that you're neatly dressed. People don't want to chat with a slob. 3. Strike up a conversation. Start by talking about the weather. 4. Greet the waitress with a smile. People would rather talk to someone who is smiling than to a grouch. The author of this profound advice, one Dr. Frank Caprio, warned, Not all conversations over a cup of coffee will lead to something, but even if they don't, you can learn something that will enrich your life from everyone you meet. 
I wondered if the Dean sisters, two Baltimore spinsters whose sad lives were featured in the Baltimore Sun, had read this piece. Reportedly, they were so lonely that they kissed the furniture in their apartment, waved out their windows to oncoming traffic, and hung out in donut shops saying hi to strangers until they got so desperate they held hands and jumped off a bridge together. After a top-selling issue treated the death of Grace Kelly with the same seriousness one would expect from the outbreak of nuclear war, the Inquirer began running updates on the attempt by a priest in Italy to have Grace canonized a saint. It was hinted that there were actual witnesses to miracles she had performed. I imagine St. Grace at the premiere of Rear Window, stepping out of her limousine, the hem of her mink coat accidentally brushing across the face of a kneeling blind fan, who was instantly cured of his affliction. The Inquirer also keeps big-time do-gooders such as Billy Graham, Art Linkletter, and Lorne Green out of trouble by publishing their folksy little advice columns on how to have happy little lives. The irony of these hypocrites allowing themselves to be connected with the most despised scandal sheet in the professional Hollywood community just because of its giant circulation still amazes me. But even more insane and ludicrous is the Inquirer's bad stepchild, the one they never talk about, the rag put out apparently to utilize the old Inquirer's black and white press, the weekly world news. Closer in spirit to the old I ate my baby Inquirer before it got upscale enough to be sold in the supermarket, this fanatical right-wing prime example of hepatitis yellow journalism seems to be popular with illiterates and not surprisingly shock-loving hardcore punks and new wavers. They even had Divine on the cover because irate viewers had complained to the BBC that she was, quote, disgusting, unquote. The news's editorial policy can be best summed up by one of its stories. Ruskies vow, we'd blast Santa out of the skies. Whatever the rage in the other tabloids, they'll go further. Ape gives birth to human baby. Or vigilante kills 27 muggers. Sometimes their stories cheer me up considerably. Good news for smokers. It's good for you. Perhaps the most irresponsibly berserk columnist in the country, Ed Anger, is given space for his fanatical tirades each week in his column, My America. He's beyond belief. His homophobia is legend. Treat AIDS spreading sickos like the killers they are, he wrote once. Is there any guarantee that the guy that used the water fountain in the park ahead of your little boy is not a gay with AIDS? How about junk food made our country great? You never saw the Duke, John Wayne, strolling around munching a pita bread sandwich stuffed with alfalfa sprouts and sipping tea. If all Americans looked as washed out and wimpy as these broccoli bruces, the Ruskies would be dropping down on us and taking over right now. And best of all, I'm madder than a doctor with a broken golf club at all this belly aching about violence on TV when there's something even worse on the tube. I'm talking about the disgusting sex that's in most of today's top programs. Confirming everything I expected, an inside source of mine says Ed Anger is one Rafe Klinger, an off-the-wall guy who believes none of the stuff he cranks out. But ultimately, the Weekly World News gets old quickly. Its shock style becomes numbing, the celebrity gossip old hat, and lifted from other papers I've already read, and I go back to the Inquirer for its by-comparison class act. Celebrities, if you don't want to be in the papers, be a plumber. I guarantee no one will be interested in your private life. But if you're in the public spotlight in any way, watch out. Does Nancy Kissinger have big feet and love it? Has Gene Kirkpatrick ever had sex on a UFO? Is Margaret Thatcher having an affair with Eddie Murphy? Who wants to know? I want to know.